Hello, welcome to the Thursday, January 25th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Brad took a look at the latest Tankator malware. Now, this one follows the old pattern. It uses RTF documents that then try to exploit some reasonably recent vulnerabilities that were patched back in November. The common subject line appears to be new incoming eFax document from and then an 800 number. As Brad points out that this is pretty easily quarantined by spam filters, also standard malware protection pretty much takes care of that, in particular if you're running Windows 10 and are enabling some of the security features in Windows 10. Sort of interesting in that this particular variety did deploy a good old banking Trojan. SUSE was the tool of choice here. No ransomware for a change, but of course, uh, that kind of changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're not a developer, you may not have heard of the Electron cross-platform development framework. It's a pretty intriguing piece of software. Essentially, what you can do with Electron is that you create a web application using JavaScript, HTML, cascading style sheets, and then Electron will convert this into a native Mac OS, Linux, or Windows application for you. Now, if you use a tool like this, then of course you leave a lot of the low level bit grinding up to these frameworks. And apparently that's sort of where a mistake happened here. If one of the applications that were built with this framework did register a protocol handler. So for example, if you have anything colon slash slash and then link it to your application, well, uh, then you're actually exposing your application to an arbitrary code execution vulnerability. This would be exploited by tricking a user into clicking on a link that actually uses this protocol. So then essentially what's happening is that the URL that essentially goes with that link is being sent to the application and that's sort of where probably something didn't get escaped properly. There aren't a lot of details out yet how this would be exploited. Now, of course, the big question is here, how many applications are actually using this framework? Well, two big ones are Skype and Slack. So both of them are coded using this framework. Both of them are registering default protocol handlers like Slack colon slash slash for Slack and are vulnerable. So you have to update those applications. Other applications that don't register themselves are not vulnerable. Also only the Windows version of these applications is vulnerable. And then an older issue came back with modern scanner printer combinations or copy machines, in particular the Xerox Work Center. The problem here is the compression algorithm that's being used to actually compress the scanned image before it's being printed, and that's JBIG2. Originally, this was actually figured out in 2013. I believe I covered it here on a podcast before, but the problem with JBIG2 is that in order to compress the image, it essentially does something similar to optical character recognition. It splits the document up into different areas. If it can match up some of these areas to text, it will then substitute this. Of course, well, uh, optical character recognition sometimes goes wrong. And then the result, of course, is that the wrongly recognized character is being printed nice and crisp. So there is no real indication that uh, this was a character that was difficult to identify. And if you are one of the more paranoid internet users, then maybe sometimes you turn off JavaScript in order to make it more difficult for a website to track you. And well, uh, that's somewhat successful, of course. The website may just no work these days, but uh, there are other tricks, for example, cascading style sheets. And probably the last thing you wanna do on any kind of a website these days is turn off cascading style sheets. Cascading style sheets have a lot of sort of script like features these days that, for example, allow cascading style sheets to adapt themselves to screen resolutions, to different browser 
types and also to preload resources as needed. And these tricks can be used against the user in order to track the browser. Code posted to GitHub by Jan Böhmer does implement a neat library that does exactly this and allows you to also play with this a little bit on his demo page. And well, this is it for today. Thanks again for listening. And remember, we still have the contest going on. If you find any factual inaccuracies and already got a quite a good number of submissions, doesn't matter how little it is. Uh, I don't weight them or anything. Any submission is just being entered into my random number generator and uh, we'll pull five Raspberry Pis out of it sometime end of next week, probably. 